It's very nice to be part of the evening that honors our new president, Stanley. Um, Bob said that uh, Sam and um, Mary Pearl, who is not with us tonight, are among our programs seeking excellence. Of course, that's out of the question where we're concerned, but <laughs> we're a very nice group of people, as you may have <laughs> concluded. <laughs> we try to write as well as possible. <laughs> and we like one another. Uh, when I was in uh, Waco pursuing the $200,000, um, <laughs> by the way, I should say uh, uh, <laughs> parenthetically that I haven't won this thing yet, and I'm up against uh, a mathematician from Williams and a historian from the University of Arkansas, i.e. I'm up against people who actually know something. So I don't think I really do have much of a chance for this stuff, but I'm certainly gaining a lot of friends in anticipation of my winning. <laughs> They asked me during this thing w about teaching methods, and I don't have any, as many in this room will attest. Um, but uh, I did say I had a couple of things that, um, I, uh, that sort of guided me. And one of them, oddly enough, is uh, I like my students. And it sounds, um, it sounds like kind of a flimsy or watery thing to say, but actually one f learns, as the t my distinguished colleagues know as writers and teachers, that if you like your students, the conversations in class become more ample, more imaginative. Um, the, uh, you're freed from uh, uh, any burdens of uh, egoism or any of the other things that can cripple teaching. And um, we are all very lucky here, and perhaps not so lucky in the sense that we worked at it, uh, to be among people we admire, as I admire my colleagues tonight and um, all my colleagues, um, uh, students uh, too, um, and feel a, a great affection, a great affection for them. Um, so welcome, Dr. Stanley. Uh, you may be sure that um, this quarter, this little quarter of the university will never let you down. I'm going to read a few sections from Making Toast, which is an expansion of uh, an essay I did for the New Yorker last December. It's a memoir of my family um, after the death of our daughter, uh, Amy, um, uh, who died nearly two, uh, uh, two years ago. Um, and when I say family, I again digress to think that Bob Reeves, who's been remarkable in shaping and guiding our program for many years now, has always referred to us as a family. And I saw the fruit of that um, uh, with deep, heartfelt appreciation when so many um, of our faculty came to Amy's funeral in Washington and wrote and sent presence to our grandchildren and did everything that a family does. And we tried to do the same for Luann Walker, whose husband Speed died not long after uh, Amy. We gather around and hold uh, to each other, um, not only in the light moments uh, here, uh, which are wonderful to share, but in those more testing moments when uh, we are about to fall to our knees. Um, so I'm going to read a few sections. And, uh, the memoir is in uh, uh, sections. And I'll, the, the, ca the cast of characters, if I refer to them, um, uh, uh, about whom the book uh, is, are Harris, our son-in-law, uh, Amy's husband, a hand surgeon, uh, who's a remarkable fellow and very strong and very good and very funny and um, all the things that a great father should be. Uh, Lagaya, who is the um, nanny for uh, James, and she gave us wonderful advice uh, at the beginning of this. She said, you are not the first to whom such a thing has happened, and you are better able to handle it than most. And um, the, uh, that wisdom has, uh, has, has uh, guided us, girded us um, for these uh, two years. Uh, Jesse, who was six, Jessica, who was six, um, when Amy died, Sammy, who was four, and James, who was then known as Bubbies, now he's James because he's a grown man of three, whereas then he was uh, 14, uh, 14 months. Um, the, uh, so it's about all, all these folks, and uh, it's about principally about Amy. Amy Elizabeth Rosenblatt Solomon, 38 years old, pediatrician, wife of hand surgeon Harrison Solomon, and mother of three, collapsed on her treadmill in the downstairs playroom at home. Jesse and Sammy discovered her, our oldest son, Carl, told us on the phone. Carl lives in Fairfax, Virginia, not far from Amy and Harris, with his wife, Wendy, and their two boys, Andrew and Ryan. Jesse had run upstairs to Harris, 
Mommy isn't talking, she said. Harris got to Amy within seconds but, and tried CPR, but her heart had stopped and she could not be revived. Amy's was ruled a sudden death due to an anomalous heart right coronary artery, meaning both her coronary arteries fed her heart from the same side. Normally, the arteries are located on both sides of the heart so that if one fails, the other can do the work. In Amy's heart, they ran alongside each other. They could have been squeezed between the aorta and the pulmonary artery, which can expand during physical exercise. The blood flow was cut off. Her condition, affecting less than two thousandths of one percent of the population, was asymptomatic. She might have died at any time of her life. She would have appreciated the clarity of the verdict. Amy was a very clear person, even as a small child, knowing intuitively what plain good sense a particular, uh, sorry, a particular situation required. She had a broad expanse of forehead, dark, nearly black hair, and hazel eyes. Both self-confident and selfless, when she faced you, there could be no doubt you were the only thing on her mind. Her clarity could make her severe with her family, especially her two brothers. Carl and John, our youngest, withered when she excoriated them for such offenses as invading a room. She could also poke you gently with her wit. When she was about to graduate from the NYU School of Medicine, her class had asked me to be speaker. A tradition of the school allows a, pa a, a past graduate to place the hood of the gown on a current graduate. Harris, who had graduated the previous year, was set to hood Amy. At dinner the night before the ceremony, a friend remarked, Amy, isn't it great? Your dad is giving the graduation speech and your fiancé is doing the hood. Amy said, it is, and it's also pretty great that I'm graduating. <laughs> Yet her clarity could also contributed to her kindness. When she was six, I was driving her and three friends to a birthday party. One of the girls got carsick. The other two backed away, understandably, with cries of ooh and yuck. Amy drew closer to the stricken child to comfort her. So we moved in at, with Harris's uh, encouragement. Ginny and I moved in, moved into the Bethesda, where we are uh, living. Uh, Jesse asked me, uh, uh, Bapo, which is my uh, grandfatherly name, uh, Bapo, how long are you staying? And I said, forever. And we mean it. Or at least we mean it until Harris finds a life that doesn't require us. While Lagaya and Ginny look after Bubbies and Sammy, I take Jesse to the bus stop. On a damp, gray morning, we stand together at the corner of our street. One by one, down the hill come the mothers of the neighborhood, their kids running beside them. An impromptu soccer game develops. Jesse joins in. The scene passes for pleasant and ordinary, unless one notes the odd presence of the lone grandfather. With luck, Ginny and I will live to see all three children grown into adults, and Jesse will become a teenager and throw fits about boyfriends and stamp her feet and yell that we don't understand a thing, not a thing. But today I help her with her oversized pink backpack and her little umbrella with pink butterflies before she boards the school bus. And I stand looking as the bus drives off and tell the mothers to have a good day.